Hello, everyone. I'm Guido Molinari, Managing Partner at Prism Group, and welcome to our panel on trade finance. Very excited to have our speakers with us today. Uh, Danny Cotti is the Managing Director of Center of Excellence Banking and Trade at Marco Polo, Kieran McGowan, CEO at WeTrade, and Suleyma Badi, CEO at Congo. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Hello. So starting with Danny, uh, can you brief, briefly introduce yourself and your network? Yes, so I'm representing the Marco Polo Network, which is uh, a uh, distributed network leveraging the core network of nodes with applications for trade finance and working capital. Uh, the company I'm working for is TradeIX. We have two roles. We are the software developer and platform developer but we are also the business network operator for the Marco Polo network. And I'm looking after the senior relationship of our clients, both on the bank side as well as on the corporate side. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Kieran? Hi, Guido. I'm, I'm Kieran McGowan, CEO of WeTrade. And WeTrade is all about liquidity and cash flow enhancement for merchants. We have 15 banks live in WeTrade. And uh, we onboard merchants who traditionally didn't have access to, to guarantees or invoice financing or factoring. And it's really about enhancing their cash flow. I have a couple of good use cases, Guido, to, to give you an idea of how it's used. Uh, like we have an Italian medical device manufacturer who uh, the trading relationship broke down with one of their buyers because it just kept paying late. So uh, basically, we trade allowed them to guarantee that payment. And we, we had a French soft drinks manufacturer, 71% of their invoices were being paid late. And again, WeTrade was able to help that soft drinks manufacturer to get guaranteed payment from their, their buyers. Uh, also another example, a large French agricultural business conglomerate, they were just afraid to do business with some of their SMEs in case they didn't get paid. And WeTrade helped facilitate that. And then we have things like prepayment, um, where maybe a startup company in Sweden, uh, it, effectively their cash flow was pretty poor. And uh, Nordea helped them in terms of getting cash access and access to credit so that they could complete a deal with a, with a Spanish supplier. And then things like cyber crime, uh, preventing hacking of bank account details and phishing. So just a number of use cases that we trade is used for. Perfect. Thank you, Kieran, and looking forward to hearing more. Um, Sulema, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and your network? Thank you, Guido. Hi, everyone. So I'm the CEO of Comgo. So Comgo is a company incorporated in Geneva. It's also a software that provides four families of product to its users. Uh, so the first family is the trade finance family, right? So where you can issue LCs, standby LCs, LOIs, you can release goods. Uh, all, in, all in the same place. Um, the second family is, is the market family, uh, where you can um, optimize your liquidity um, as per quotes on receivable discounting, on the um, confirmation of letters of credit. The third family is KYC, uh, that allows you to perform your KYC with any of your counterparts on the network or outside the network on a much more automated, secure, and efficient way. And the fourth family is Track, which allows you to register your documents on the chain and build a digital audit trail of every action performed with the document. Uh, so today, these, um, these, these products are used and this software is used by approximately 150 corporates and banks um, all across the world. So in, this, in the US zone, Europe and Asia. Um, this represents a bit more than 1,000 individual users um, and um, that's where we are. Excellent. Thank you. I'm really excited to have you all three here. Um, so, um, as you know, the WTO issued a report uh, last November um, talking about, you know, blockchain and DLT in trade and sort of giving a reality check. And it is a big survey of, you know, where, what is happening in the industry. And trade finance really came across as the most active sector within trade. And, even if compared to other, you know, big industry that have adopted the blockchain, you know, we do see 11 networks, at least according to the WTO report, that are being built in trade finance. Um, why do you feel that, you know, this sector of trade finance has been such active for blockchain initiatives? Uh, maybe, Salima, you want to you go first? 
I think this this industry is 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 really really um, characterized by very ancient old ways of working that carry massive operational risks and efficiencies uh, due to the fact that no one has the same vision of a transaction, right? Mm. And uh, when you take a transaction, you have multiple participants in in each of them, and they are all spreaded around the world. Um, so it's it's um, that's I think. First reasons, I think the, the fraud increase in our industry, especially on the commodity side, um, has also uh, pushed uh, digital solutions forward, right? Uh, because it's much more difficult to, to fraud when you have the same vision of the document or when you share the same vision of a transaction between uh, participants. Uh, and um, and I think that this this new technology has been seen as an answer uh, to the to solve the business problems of this industry and to better answer uh, to the characteristics I've just um, explained about this industry. Thank you, Suleiman. Danny, do you want to add something? Yes, as Suleiman said, uh, there are key challenges in uh, in in the trade finance industry, uh, resulting from. Uh, uh, archaic systems and, and legacy systems, semi-automated processes, uh, and everybody is recording data, but the data is not connected. So interoperability and few of the same transaction is uh, uh, is obviously not granted, and and therefore uh, uh, valuable trade data is trapped. Uh, companies cannot get access to trade financing or not easily get access to trade financing. And uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a manual uh, process at, at the banks, at the corporates, uh, at the port o- operators, uh, the ship owners, etc. And so the whole administration is, is really complicated. A lot of efforts have been done to automate. Certain steps are automated and work mm-hmm. well. But as a whole, the industry is not connected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Kieran, uh, anything on your on your side, not from looking from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I think trade finance is a network business, and uh, apart from SWIFT, there aren't any interconnected networks. I mean, the banks have their proprietary systems, and that's kind of counterintuitive to the nature of trade. Like traditionally, banks were competing with each other, and insurance companies. And it was counterintuitive for them to collaborate with each other, very protective of their client base, reluctant to move to the cloud, right? and, and a lot of a lack of innovation over the last 70 years. But blockchain is changing that. It's reducing the dependency on the banks. And I think that's creating an opportunity that the banks see that they have to remain in the trade flow and get involved. And the cost savings is one side of it, uh, but new disruptive models and new ecosystems and generating new revenue from disruptive models, that's really accelerating that need for those competitive banks to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So it seems you know, from all, all, all of you that um, really we're looking at an archaic system with you know silos of data and, and really a need for disruption and, and blockchain could be the right technology. Um, now, in the WTO report, you know, they surveyed participants from the trade industry and think and asked them about the timeline. You know, when is it going to happen that you know blockchain is going to become the new normal? And on average, you know, the answer again, this was back in November before COVID, uh, so a bit of a different world from where we live today. But the average uh, answer was, you know, four to seven years to really see a pivotal, pivotal change, right? Um, in your perspective, is is that the timeline that you have internally in your team and do you think you know what has been happening with the coronavirus outbreak in the last few months has that accelerated the timeline or that slowed down things uh, maybe Sulema, maybe you want to go first i think that things have changed a lot uh, following the past events right um i think that there's no more debate around moving digital uh, mm-hmm. today it's a must-have uh, and and we must be able to execute and to onboard clients the sooner the better. So what we have noticed over the past weeks is that there's a lot of energy and excitement here. Um, we, we have been building the, this software over the past five years and, um, and now people really want to use it on an everyday basis. Um, and, uh, and we are in our scaling phase massively. Um, and uh, yes, COVID has been a strong accelerator as well as, as the fraud cases. Huh? I really want to insist on those two factors, which, which are a bit connected, certainly at a certain point. Huh? But, but the industry doesn't want to cope with false invoices or double finance invoices anymore. And, uh, and those, those, two, um, those two events combined 
are really accelerating the the adoption and 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 we're going to be there way sooner than expected six months or nine months ago fascinating uh, kieran have you seen something similar you know for we trade as you know covid impacted in a quote unquote at the end positive way the, the development of the network Yes. Yeah, so if, if the World Trade Organization suggested a four to seven year time frame, I think COVID is accelerating that perhaps to a three to four year outlook. I mean, a recent IBM survey showed that uh, 41% of the blockchain or returns on investment um, were positive and that, that the, the idea of this trough of disillusionment, we've kind of come through that and out the other side. I mean, it's still very much virgin territory, blockchain technology, legal, regulatory frameworks, but uh, we've broken a lot of new ground in security and compliance. And uh, I know that can have an impact on certain networks, but uh, that's where, again, we trade has focused a lot on that high bar of compliance and security and, and getting that in place. So I think that the technology has really evolved really rapidly in the last two years. Uh, it's certainly on the downward stabilization end of the, the Gartner hype curve. So it's definitely, it's faster, it's, it's better, it's cheaper. And even the, like we're on the Hyperledger Fabric network, and they have learned a lot from the journey with WeTrade and how to improve the Hyperledger Fabric uh, network. So we're, look, we're two years into the journey. We've gained a huge amount of learnings. And through that learnings, particularly the merchant feedback as with those live transactions. So to optimize our costs, to, to go multi-cloud, um, to do on-premise, but it really to align on standards is the other thing, because I think it's going to be all about the network of networks and, and connecting to other geographies, to other technologies and to other services like insurance and logistics. So I, I, I definitely think COVID is accelerating that outlook. And Danny, you, you shared the view of your colleagues here on this panel. Um, you've seen a sort yes. of similar effect. Yes, uh, 100%. Uh, I'm actually even more optimistic, and I think mm -hmm. the timeline is even shorter. It's two to three years, but COVID has certainly put an accelerator in. Also, in the, in the, immediate, the immediate impact was paralysis for, for some of the banks and some of the corporates, but now that everybody understands that, that uh, the longer term impact uh, of it, uh, everybody focuses on it. And we have also uh, modified our product roadmap. We have created a new product that is called Supplier Early Pay, mm -hmm. uh, which will give uh, for payables finance solutions, supplier the and of any size, and this is predominantly directed to SME suppliers, mm -hmm. give them uh, access to liquidity in their supply chain much earlier and much faster uh, through through the Marco Polo network. So yes, uh, it is an accelerator and, and those timelines, uh, they, they will easily be beaten. Thank you, Danny. And yeah, I mean, knowing a lot of SMEs, I'm sure they have welcomed the fact that they get more liquidity in these very difficult times. Yeah. Um, Danny, actually, my, my next question is for you. You know, we, we have talked in the past and you know the WTO report has a very strong focus on the bank side of this network but you mentioned to me that it is equally important maybe more important at this point to focus on the corporates right so sort of we have the banks that are willing to finance but you do need to get the corporate user willing to be traded you know what you know why do you think that is so important and you know what step has your network taken in that direction well ultimately the corporates are paying the bills for the banks <laughs> and for uh, the networks right because they are the end users in, in, in their function as buyers or sellers, or in their function as traders in intermediating uh, the exchange, uh, exchange of goods. So they are the end user of whatever we are building and whatever we are offering. Uh, and uh, therefore it's critical uh, to, to have solutions that, that really benefit uh, the corporate execution of their commercial activities and contracts uh, and that's what we are focusing on on, on, on the Marco Polo network. Uh, you obviously need to have a certain amount of banks available on your on your network to provide the liquidity and provide the funding. But then the origination, the volumes, uh, the adoption comes from the corporate side. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Kieran or Sulema, do you guys have anything to mention on this topic from, from your end and your network perspective? Well, just continuing on from the just we were talking about the COVID impact, and I think 
it's really the SMEs, Guido, that have been impacted by the COVID more than anybody. I mean, they, they represent 95% uh, of all companies, 60% uh, of value, and they've seen a lot of rejection in terms of access to credit. Mm -hmm. So they really need to convert their trade receivables into cash. And the whole purpose behind we trade is really to support those merchants who traditionally didn't have access to those guarantees and financing. And I think blockchain really has given them the, the high transparency, the swift transaction execution, uh, and secure data handling without the paper documentation. So it's really that COVID has done a number of things. It's highlighting that the current banking solutions for SMEs are, have, aren't being delivered in the correct way. Uh, goods are being delayed at the ports, uh, manual processes. So it's re-emphasizing really the importance of delivering timely financing to those SMEs. And it's really re-emphasizing the need for trade digitalization and paperless solutions. Thank you, Kieran. And Salema, have you seen something similar? You know, you guys, I know, focus a lot on commodities. So uh, not only, we also have non-commodity clients. And, and to go back to the point on corporates and banks, I think it's very valid to say that you need both. And that's why the company was founded by and is owned today by nine banks and nine corporates. It allows us to build a balanced product. That's very important, not to have the perception of being too much one or too much the other. Um, but, but it's also true that the software brings a lot of efficiency to the banks and the banks are ready to pay for it. Huh? because they can demonstrate when they use it, that they, um, they can do more, uh, more, they can master more their operational risk, they can do more secured business uh, using the software. So it's, it's a huge uh, benefit for them, right? Not only for the corporates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, one theme that seems to have appeared a few, a few times already is the idea of cost efficiency, right? You know, reducing costs for participants. Um, of course, you know, if we look at any industry, when, when you're reducing costs, for somebody, those costs are actually revenues. So um, who is standing to lose from blockchain becoming the new normal in, in trade finance? You know, what, I mean, are there some banks that ultimately are the, you know, sort of the friction right now? Or are there other players existing trade finance solutions? And uh, maybe Salima, you, you want to start on this? That, that's a good point, actually. I don't think anybody's losing today because if you look at the past 10 years, what has happened to banks, especially after the OFAC uh, fines that the banks have been going through, is that they have massively invested on compliance controls, right, to be able to match those new standards. And they have much less invested on operational, uh, upgrading their operational setup. Um, and today, if you look at the way banks operate, their, their, their employees are spending most of their time doing controls, redoing controls, putting data into the system, printing it, doing that again. And I think that moving digital is a question of survival for them today because they cannot, um, they cannot have originators doing controls and inputting data because it has been such, it has become so massive um, the, the needs of control and the robustness of, of the operational systems that they have no choice than to move digital. For, so for me, it's, it's more a question of survival um, and, and, and profitability of the business than anything mm -hmm. else. Uh, so that's on the efficiency part. Um, and, and there's the, the security part. I mean, bank, banks who finance fraudulent documents who, 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 mm -hmm. or who take orders from the wrong person or who spend hours uh, checking who has sent the order. And, and this has become really problematic during COVID and because during, during callbacks on landlines, when people are not in the office anymore, yeah. you just miss payments. And this has happened to a lot of people, right? Um, uh, and on top of that, it's easier and easier to produce fraudulent documents. So I think that companies really need efficient tools to help them allow their employees to focus on what is key for them, which is monitoring their risk properly, onboarding customers, executing transactions. So I, given the state of the industry today, I don't think anybody's going to lose. Okay. Thank you. Danny, do you share that view or, you know, I know you have a long career. Yeah, in I, I think if, uh, <laughs> if you, uh, there, there is a Bain company a study that showed 50 to 80% of cost saves because of blockchain uh, applications. Uh, uh, I, I think that might be a little bit overstated. Uh, mm -hmm. Our work we are doing with our members show 30 to 40 percent cost saves uh, in, uh, in in their operations, whether they're banks or whether they're whether they're corporates. Uh, 
Uh, I think to, to find losers, I think people that are involved in legacy technology will, cha- will have to change their business model and their focus. Otherwise, they will be losing out. And uh, people that are operating destination platforms might also lose out over time. Uh, but they are, there's, a, there's a, a shifting going on in the industry towards the digital scenarios. And, 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 and we see a, a lot of uh, third-party service providers, uh, a, a lot of banks, a lot of tech firms, uh, a lot of companies really moving to the digital space and creating new opportunities and new jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and Kieran, I know you mentioned a lot of SMEs, you know, do you, do you see, I mean, they will definitely gain, but do you see anybody like that, you know, potentially would be displaced by blockchain becoming the new normal? Well, certainly any of the middlemen or the brokers probably won't have a part to play in blockchain. But when, when companies do embrace blockchain, I, I agree with Salima that few will lose and many will gain through the network effect. So it's really about growing the market size and growing the market share. And that you know, trust transparency is the new normal. So the, the need for the improved financial products, uh, speedy decision making being critical. So, I mean, I do think that uh, what, we're, what we're trying to achieve is more like what Airbnb did for the accommodation industry or the low cost airlines did for international travel. It's more a disruptive play. It's creating that new market. So we're looking at that open account market, again, where merchants traditionally didn't have access to finance. And it's really about the advantages for the banks then is driving the new market gains. And uh, of course, you mentioned the whole cost side of it there, Guido. I mean, low cost equals higher trading and the, the cost reductions plus uh, new business models is really what we're, we're trying to achieve here and reducing all those manual processes. So it's bringing more clients and then reducing the cost through digitization. Thank you, Kieran. Um, so my, my next question is for you and you know, regards governance of this network. So. Um, you know, out of the WTO report, it shows that, you know, several banks are members and, you know, play a role in the governance of even competing networks at time, um, including, you know, there are overlapping members among your free networks. Uh, my question is, you know, you were associated with General before joining Congo. Do you see this, you know, as a potential risk for a network or is it an opportunity because, you know, you have members that can see what is happening, the governance of other networks and sort of like, uh, see uh, share best practices you know what is what is your view on uh, from this perspective it depends a bit on which 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 side you you answer so if i answer on sogen side right um when it comes to innovation i think it's more than usual to test several technologies and and mm-hmm. ways of innovating and hedge your bets mm-hmm. so this makes a lot of sense yeah. from their perspective to have done that as well as the other institutions right um, when it comes to Congo, uh, the company is, is not governed as a consortium at all. It is a, it is a company independently incorporated with a mm-hmm. board uh, which, which gathers only half of its shareholders. So it's, it's a okay. very efficient board that works very well. And the people that are representing those institutions in our board uh, are not connected to, to other platforms. They're really okay. here to make Congo a success uh, uh, thanks to their I mean, they have fiduciary duties as, as, as directors, right? Okay. Uh, so, so what we have been focusing on on our side is, is really to, to build this production platform, to bring it to the users, to onboard the users, and, and to make their everyday life much more efficient, secure, and, and, uh, and better, right? So we're not acting at all as the lab of our shareholders. That's, that's their perspective, and they mm-hmm. have teams dedicated to that, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, but on our side, we really focus on our in, initial mandate, which was mm-hmm. moving to production and making this happen on an everyday basis. And when you look at the numbers, I mean, more than 20,000 LTs have been, have been issued on this network today. So it shows that it is really happening on an everyday basis. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, Danny or Karen, do you guys have anything to add on you know, from your perspective? Karen, you want to go first? Yeah, so I think um, just to, there's different types of network with different use cases and digitizing letters of credit versus a disruptive play to enhance the liquidation of companies. So really, I just think there's different different types of networks there. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we have as well a different governance model. We don't have uh, a centralized body or a legal vehicle. Uh, Marco Polo is the name of a virtual network, right? Uh, 
and TradeX plays the role as business network operator and it's governed uh, with the participating banks and corporates. And we, we will they form a, a, a steering committee that will that takes all the decisions around uh, around uh, the Marco Polo network. So yeah, so depending on on and we are an open network, we are a distributed network. So that's very different to to other setups that are that are in the industry. And we uh, our governments evolves as we go along uh, in, in in this journey. Thank you, Danny. Um, so uh, I know the topic of interoperability has, has come up and, you know, I wanted to um, spend a couple of minutes on it. Um, you know, there are various layers, of course, when you think about interoperability, you have the legacy system that, you know, from what you guys are telling me, and I hope, you know, are, are going to be eventually displaced and they are not interoperable for obvious economic reasons. Uh, then there is the interoperability between your networks and the legacy systems, right? So like, and then sort of the third layer, which is I think most of the audience would be interested is that, you know, your free networks are built on three different protocols, right? Um, which is on Hyperlaser Fabric, Marco Polo, as Danny mentioned, is, you know, on Corda by Airfree and Slema yours has been built on private Ethereum Quorum. Um, so the question is interoperability, you know, between your free networks. And then of course, there are other networks being built on each of these three protocols. And then the question is, is there interoperability between what you guys are doing on the third finance side and maybe, you know, some on the payment side that is on, built on the same, you know, uh, technology protocol. Um, so maybe starting with Slema, um, you know, how big do you think the interoperability challenge is? And, you know, thinking about these four layers, where, you know, are, you know, where is Congo doing work? Where do you think the opportunity is for, for you as a, as a network? Um, so we have been, we have we have gone through this interoperability journey with another Ethereum network. So we, we made it happen. We know what it means and we are able to do it again. And I think the key question here is what does it bring to the end user at the end of the day? Does it make sense? Does it bring added value for the user to have two networks connected? The answer is yes. I think we should do it. No doubt. It's, it's feasible. It's, it's, it, it is a challenging journey, but it is feasible. And if it makes sense for the users, no problem to do it. Then what's what's really important for us today is is uh, is the integration with the with the systems of our users, uh, and that we have built very standard ways of integrating. We have seven key banks integrated today all around the world, uh, so this brings massive added value to them in terms of of even servicing their clients because they're capable of bringing instructions much more much faster. They're capable of checking documents much faster. It brings it lowers their risk the operational risks much more than if. if the systems are not connected, right? Uh, so, so this is something that is systematic on the banking side, this integration. Um, more surprising, and I think it's really a new trend, it's also happening on the corporate side. So we're also integrating mm -hmm. our first corporate clients uh, because they, they understand that if they want to get the best out of the system, they have to be totally integrated. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a very important topic. It's a strategic topic for us to be able to support our users in that journey, and we do it on an everyday basis. Thank you. Uh, Kieran? Yeah, I definitely think that we're going to see some some more mergers and acquisitions in the space because we've got, say, the disruptive players, the digital digitization players. We've got, and you're seeing different platforms emerging in different geographies. So I definitely think over time we're going to see consolidation or developing bridges to communicate between those platforms. So our vision has always been that the network of networks and connecting not other not only to other platforms. Uh, in the trade finance space and in different geographies, but also to other types of platform like a farm to fork or logistics, for example. So with that in mind, uh, we've built for standards. So the GS1 standard, universal business language standard, and that's been particularly for um, connecting with purchase orders and invoice data. So mm -hmm. really designing that capability into not only the business or the technology side, but also the business side to really to make sure that when we're connecting blockchain networks, that that capability is there. Now, it's going to take time, Guido. I mean, I think a lot of the platforms, we have to get our own houses in order initially sure. and get our own volumes to, this, to the right levels because it, it will take a lot of funding really to do that interconnectivity. So we've already been through that process with E-Trade Connect in Hong Kong and done that initial connection. But I think the technical side is more straightforward it's going to be the legal and compliance side that will really cause more difficulties. 
So um, like we're, we're, we've partnered with IBM and we're really looking at exploring like how it, does a transaction move from a Corda to Ethereum to Hyperledger in the most effective way whilst ensuring that the trust and transparency of the data is still being exchanged. So I think it's, it's, it's going to take time, but it's definitely the demand for interconnectivity and interoperability to other platforms will stay and continue to create a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. And uh, Danny, do you have anything to add on, you know, from the Marco Polo perspective on, on the interoperability question? Yes, so I agree with my two colleagues that interoperability across networks uh, and technologies is obviously a, a, a key uh, deliverable that the industry has to deliver over the next uh, over the next years. And uh, we have kind of initiated some of this with our idea of the universal trade network that the Marco Polo brings together with TradeX and R3 brought up, and and it's now been adopted by the uh, ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, with the DSI, Digital Standards Initiative approach, that, that has been published uh, due to COVID. It has been, the, the resourcing of it has been delayed a little bit, but uh, the ICC will play that role and, and will create the standards that are required for trade finance to really operate like the telecoms industry, for instance, uh, where interoperability uh, it doesn't matter what device, what systems, what operator you work with, you can communicate with anybody else. And the same uh, aspiration uh, is valid for the for the trade industry. And uh, and a, a lot will happen in, in this sector over the next years. Thank you, Danny. Um, so I know we, we only have a minute left. So uh, sort of just last question for audience member that want to learn more about your networks. Um, you know, where can they find more information? Maybe start with Kieran. Yeah, um, on our, our website, really, Guido. So it's uh, we-trade.com. And uh, there's some like email addresses there. Just reach out and we can certainly connect. Wonderful. That's Suleyman. Same, so on comgo.io, you have the key users, you have testimonies, you have volumes, you have products, you have emails to contact us. And we will be more than happy to support you in your journey. Wonderful. You. And Danny? We don't have a website. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, joke aside, uh, obviously, we, we, you can also go to Marco Polo uh, uh, Finance, uh, sorry, Marco Polo.finance and uh, get all the information that is required uh, uh, and, and, and much more around digitalization and around what the Marco Polo Network is about. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us today for this panel and looking forward to speaking again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Guido. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.